All right. Um, so we're going to start a new story today. Um, spend the next two days working with it. Pretty sure it posted on Google Classroom already. OK, so if we go over to Google Classroom, it is a new assignment called Pet Therapy. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get Pet Therapy opened up. And uh, I'll give you guys a few minutes to get light logged in. I'm going to go ahead and start a GoGuardian session, too. So if you need to chat with me on there, feel free. Like it's the um, author? No, like, yeah, Okay. Okay, one sec. Let me start a Go Guardian session really quick. Oh, whoops. Sorry. Good, how are you? I want to do 75 minutes. That sounds good. Okay. Oh, let me turn the chat on. There we go. So, under first read, yeah. open the chat. Oh, under the toolkit? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Do you know a Cecilia in your family? No. no? They just said. Is her last name Payne? No. no. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, hopefully you guys are getting this thing opened up. Pet Therapy, How Animals and Humans Heal Each Other. It's by Julie Rovner. Um, it's a news article. So these are true stories. Um, someone is writing a story about these people, these animals. That dog kind of looks like my dog. What's your dog's name? Theo. I can't really pull a picture off the wall, but uh, like six-ish. He was a rescue, so I don't know exactly how old he is. But anyway, that's beside the point. It just looks like my dog. Um, so we're going to do basically what we have done the past like two weeks, right? We're going to go through the background information, the author, talk a little bit about those, and then we'll read the story and do our first read. So that's our goal for the day. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with the background and the author. If you're online or listening in class, I have the volume all the way up on my computer, so you might want to turn it down on yours just in case it's super loud. And I'm going to play the background information and stuff in three, two, one. Pet Therapy, How Animals and Humans Heal Each Other by Julie Rovner, news article. Background. Therapy animals help people in many ways. In general, they provide affection and comfort to people in need. Dogs are the most common therapy animals, but other species such as rabbits, monkeys, and dolphins are also used to help people. Therapy animals must be able to follow their handler's directions and interact well with people such as children and the elderly. About the author, Julie Rovner is a noted expert on health and policy issues and author of the critically praised reference volume, Healthcare Politics and Policy A to Z. She spent 16 years as a health policy correspondent for National Public Radio, where she helped lead the network's coverage of major healthcare laws and new medical programs. She has a degree in political science from the University of Michigan. Okay, so this lady, Julie Rosner, um, has a lot of. Um, She's pretty high up there in uh, in the world. Being a correspondent for the National Public Radio is pretty hardcore. Um, correspondent means that you do a lot of like, like they come to you to make sure that the news articles that they're talking about are correct. So she is big on like healthcare and health policy. So the laws about health and the National Public Radio, which is, um, 
radio that's broadcast all over the nation, anywhere in the country that you are, you can listen to National Public Radio. And uh, so they would come to her to make sure that the health information is correct. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty big deal. So she wrote this article, and we're gonna, it's about animals and how they help out humans, right? The pet therapy type of aspect of things. Typically, you'll see a dog as a, uh, like a companion, right? The pet therapy animal. Um, do you guys see this red vest on here, on the yeah. dog? Do you guys know what that red vest means? Good, it's the symbol that this dog is a service dog. Um, something that I don't think that people realize is that if you see a dog or another animal with those on, they're trained to always be aware of things that are going on around their human, right? Mm -hmm. You as a person that sees that dog should not try to pet it, talk to it, or distract it in any way. Those dogs are trying to do a job. They're paying attention to their human, and let's say their human has seizures or they have autism and something starts to happen medically with them, that dog has to be like not distracted so that it can figure out what's wrong with their human, right? Mm -hmm. So if you do see these types of animals out with a human, don't distract it. Don't go talk to it. Don't try and pet it. They're trying to do a job. And as much as the dogs are probably super cute and you want to pet them, it's a bad idea. If you distract it, it could hurt that human that needs the help. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so let's say someone that does have a service animal has seizures. Yeah, so if, let's say that a human has seizures and they have a service animal next to them, the animal is trained to pick up on the cues of those humans. They know what signs their human shows when they're about to have a seizure and they will go alert someone or they'll do something that gets someone's attention to be like, hey, my human needs help, right? Um, there are dogs that lead around um, people that are blind. So they're trained to be the eyes of that person. If you distract that dog, it might not be good, right? So basically these dogs are doing their job and if you distract them, it's not gonna be great for that human potentially. So keep that in mind if you ever see one around. Um, it's something that I notice out and about a lot that there'll be a service dog and someone will distract it and it's and then the human is like, can you please not talk to my dog, right? So it probably does frustrate them because a lot of people aren't aware of how important those dogs are to those humans, right? Okay, I'll be done with my spiel for the day. Let's go ahead and listen to our story. It's a little bit long. I'll probably stop in the middle just to make sure that we are all good on it. So I'm going to go ahead and start it in three, two, one. Pet Therapy, How Animals and Humans Heal Each Other by Julie Rodner. Those of us who own pets know they make us happy, but a growing body of scientific research is showing that our pets can also make us healthy or healthier. That helps explain the increasing use of animals, dogs and cats mostly, but also birds, fish, and even horses. In settings ranging from hospitals and nursing homes to schools, jails, and mental institutions. Take Viola, or Vi for short. The retired guide dog is the resident canine at the Children's Inn on the campus of the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. The inn is where families stay when their children are undergoing experimental therapies at NIH. Vi, a chunky yellow Labrador retriever with a perpetually wagging tail, greets families as they come downstairs in the morning and as they return from treatment in the afternoon. She can even be checked out for a walk around the bucolic NIH grounds. There really isn't a day when she doesn't brighten the spirits of a kid at the inn and an adult and a staff member, says Meredith Daly, the inn spokeswoman. But Bai may well be doing more than just bringing smiles to the faces of stressed out parents and children. Dogs like Bai have helped launch an entirely new field of medical research over the past three decades or so. The use of pets in medical settings actually dates back more than 150 years, 
says Aubrey Fine, a clinical psychologist and professor at California State Polytechnic University. One could even look at Florence Nightingale recognizing that animals provided a level of social support in the institutional care of the mentally ill, says Fine, who has written several books on the human-animal bond. But it was only in the late 1970s that researchers started to uncover the scientific underpinnings for that bond. One of the earliest studies, published in 1980, found that heart attack patients who owned pets lived longer than those who didn't. Another early study found that petting one's own dog could reduce blood pressure. More recently, says Rebecca Johnson, a nurse who heads the Research Center for Human-Animal Interaction at the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine, studies have been focusing on the fact that interacting with animals can increase people's level of the hormone oxytocin. That is very beneficial for us, says Johnson. Oxytocin helps us feel happy and trusting, which, Johnson says, may be one of the ways that humans bond with their animals over time. But Johnson says it may also have longer-term human health benefits. Oxytocin has some powerful effects for us in the body's ability to be in a state of readiness to heal and also to grow new cells, so it predisposes us to an environment in our own bodies where we can be healthier. Animals can also act as therapists themselves or facilitate therapy, even when they're not dogs or cats. For example, psychologist Fine, who works with troubled children, uses dogs in his practice, and also a cockatoo and even a bearded dragon named Tweedle. One of the things that's always been known is that the animals help a clinician go under the radar of a child's consciousness because the child is much more at ease and seems to be much more willing to reveal, he says. Horses have also become popular therapists for people with disabilities. The beauty of the horse is that it can be therapeutic in so many different ways, says Brianna Bornhorst, executive director of the Northern Virginia Therapeutic Riding Program in Clifton, Virginia. Some of our riders might benefit from the connection and the relationship building with the horse and with their environment. Other riders maybe will benefit physically from the movements and build that core strength and body awareness and muscle memory. On a recent day, one of the therapeutic riding program's instructors, speech therapist Kathy Coleman, worked one-on-one -on -one with nine-year-old Ryan Shank Rowe, who has autism. All right, so let's stop there for a second. There's a lot of information there, right, about different animals helping out humans. What were just a couple of ways that these therapy animals helped? What could they do? What is autism? Autism is a neurological disorder that, I don't know, it's hard to describe. It kind of makes you like, it's, so yeah. Can it kind of make you think like, so if you have autism and you're like 11 years old, it depends on how severe your autism is, yeah. So autism can um, affect your mental capacity, so your ability to learn things can be hard. Um, your physical um, body can be affected by autism, but it's a, it's just a disability that is it's pretty common, decently common. Um, yeah. Um, let's see, what does this thing say? It's a condition that can make communication and interaction with other people difficult. People that have autism tend to have um, difficulty connecting with other humans as well. Um, their ability to talk to people is not always the greatest. So things like that. Do you know Emmy? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think Emmy has, the, yeah, I think she has Down syndrome, which is different than autism slightly. Yeah. yeah. It can. It depends on the, the severity of it, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so what sort of um, help can these pets give people? What were a couple of the ways that they helped people? Can't it help like, older people that like, heart attacks live longer? Okay, yeah, so petting your dog or having a dog can make you live a little bit longer if you have a heart attack. Um, 
Yeah, you can feel happier and more trusting. Probably. Yeah. Potentially. Definitely depends on the household. Um, they talked about how one psychologist uses um, a cockatoo. Do you guys know what a cockatoo is? It's a bird. It's kind of like a parrot. One of the dancing Yeah, it's kind of like a parrot. Um, and then uh, a bearded dragon, which is like a small little, like a lizard thing. Yeah. So it doesn't have to just be a dog or a cat that's a therapy animal. We're about to learn about a horse, too, that's a therapy animal um, for this nine-year-old. So let's go ahead and uh, keep reading on this one. We are on paragraph 19. Not really one-on-one. -on -one. The co-therapist in this session was a speckled pony named Happy. Walk on, said Ryan, and Happy obediently did. Excellent, Coleman replied. As the session progressed, Ryan made Happy trot, weave in and out of poles, and he even rode bareback all the while answering Coleman's questions and keeping up a continual back and forth chatter. Coleman says she used to see Ryan in a more formal office environment, but since he started horseback riding, his speech has actually improved. So with that, like we said, Ryan has autism, which means that he might not be the greatest at communicating with others. Um, so his speech and talking might be not the most clear or maybe it's hard for him to just get words out in general and then being on the horse gives makes him feel more relaxed so when he's doing that he's more willing and able to just kind of talk and have a conversation with someone more so than sitting across from the therapist face to face and trying to talk to her okay i don't think that i don't think they would be very good at it because they probably want to go do they're probably yeah i mean do you guys really want to just sit across from someone and talk to them about um, Yeah, so it's just, it puts people more at ease, right, to go out on horseback. The psychologist Coleman is probably walking along next to the horse and just talking to Ryan. And you can tell that Ryan's speech is getting better and better. Hang on, I'm getting a call. One second. Okay, sorry. Um, so let's go ahead and keep reading on this one. We are on 23, paragraph 23. Here we go. I get greater engagement, greater alertness, more language, more processing, all those things, she says. Plus, he's just really good at it. And Ryan's mother, Donna Shank, says the writing has helped with more than just his speech. It's helped his following directions, some really core life skills about getting dressed and balance, which really translate to a lot of safety issues, too. But not all the research is focused on the humans. We want to know how the animals are benefiting from the exchange, says Johnson of the University of Missouri. Much of Johnson's research, for example, has focused on the value of dog walking by studying volunteers who walk dogs at animal shelters. She even wrote a book, Walk a Hound, Lose a Pound. Those programs have clearly helped people get healthier, she says. Not only do they increase their exercise while they're walking the dog, but it increases their awareness so that they exercise more during the week. But it turns out the program was also helping the dogs. What we found was that they were significantly more likely to be adopted if they were in the dog walking group, she says, thanks to the additional exercise and socialization they were getting. Johnson is now working on a new project with likely benefits for dogs and humans. Military veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan are providing shelter dogs with basic obedience training. 
And while it's still early in the research, she says, one thing seems pretty clear. Helping the animals is helping the veterans to readjust to being at home. Now, the research is getting an even bigger scientific boost. The National Institutes of Health, with funding from pet food giant Mars, Inc., recently created a federal research program to study human-animal interaction. The program, operated through the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, offers scientists research grants to study the impact of animals on child development in physical and psychological therapeutic treatments and on the effects of animals on public health, including their ability to reduce or prevent disease. Johnson says it's critical to establish the scientific foundation for the premise that animals are good for people, even if that seems obvious. The last thing we want is for an entire field to be based on warm, fuzzy feelings and not on scientific data, she says. So it's very important that now the NIH is focused on this, and it is helping scientists across the country, like myself, to be able to do our research. All right. So the last part there was talking about how they're studying and doing research studies on how animals and humans benefit each other, right? So one of the things that they were doing, um, did they say the they were taught? Uh, let's see, they were doing a project on um, military veterans and returning home from war, and if they work with dogs, it seems to help them readjust coming home from war easier. Um, so there's a benefit there for the humans. How does that obedience training benefit the dogs too? Probably makes them happy. They get to see people. What else? Well, if you're getting obedience training, what is happening? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So these are shelter dogs, dogs that are in shelters. And if they're getting obedience training, they're learning how to say, obey the humans. If you go to the shelter and you see a dog that is calmer and more well behaved, are you more likely to adopt them? Yes. Probably. So it probably helps a lot of these dogs get adopted and put into their forever homes as well. Right? So there's all kinds of benefits for the animals and for the humans. So it's a two-way street. Just because they're helping us doesn't mean that we're not helping them out too, right? So let's go ahead and look at our first read. What we're going to do is just this chart. So we're going to go ahead and open up our chart here. And then put our title. Whoa, not print. That's OK. I'm just going to write pet therapy. Okay, so go ahead and get that typed out really quick. All right. And then we are going to talk about the story, a little bit of who and what is involved, as well as a summary, how we can connect to this, all that stuff. Basically, what we always do. Let me check my attendance really quick. I think I've got everybody. OK. So. Let's start with the general ideas about this Jones. Uh, article. Yeah, what's up? Do I do this one? Because I only have the text questions. Um, no, that's okay. Just make sure you're listening along, okay? Okay. All right. So, what is this news article about? What's the main idea of our news article? <laughs> so, this news article is about um, pet therapy, yes, and how animals and humans help each other? Yeah. Okay. And then I'd like for you guys to talk about who was involved. Who is involved in the helping of each other? Yeah, who's involved, yep. Um, I don't think police dogs are necessarily service dogs. 
but they are definitely trained animals that you don't want to walk up to probably like they're trained to like yeah like yeah it really depends on that. Yeah. Yeah, so um the the dogs that are part of the um police those are called the K9 units. Um and typically that dog, the, the, the police officer that owns the dog, they're super smart, right? The police officer that works with the dog typically takes the dog home too. Like the dog lives with them. Exactly. Yeah, it's its pet um, that also just goes to work and is trained when it's on the job to help out their partner, their police officer partner. And without dogs, I'm just thinking like, how That's true. Um, yeah, there, there's dogs that are trained um, with their their smell, right? They'll smell a piece of clothing or a blanket or something from a kid and follow that smell to wherever the kid has wandered off to, if that's the case. Yeah. So these animals are smart. They definitely have the ability to help us out for sure. Morning. Hi. All right. Um. Real quick, let's talk about who was involved in this. Just in general, who's involved? Uh, dogs. Uh, dogs. Tweedle. Tweedle. Who is Tweedle? Uh, the bearded dragon. Who else is involved? Um, a horse. There was a horse at one point. Good. Oh, wait, I did. That's okay. Just make sure you have both. You guys are forgetting one major uh, thing that's also involved. Yeah, yeah, humans in general, right? The kid. There was a kid named Ryan. There's a lot of psychologists. So yeah, the who is basically animals and humans, right? I did chicken. This is what. This is what. But it asks both, so you want both. Who? What is well, it about? That's fine. You can combine them. Okay. If you guys are done typing, um, we've done this next section quite a few times. The annotating. So I want you to go back and highlight two things. Two important details. That's all we always do. Oh, for the notice part, um, it depends on what it asks. When it's a story, like one, the one from yesterday, that's um, fiction, mm -hmm. they uh, they usually ask the who, what, when, where, and why, right? Mm -hmm. Just to get the whole picture of the story. If it is nonfiction, like a news article like this, they usually ask what is it about and who is involved instead of the the plot, right? Because there's not really a plot to a news article. Okay. So go ahead and highlight two important things. The horse's name was, I don't remember. Um, Happy, that was it. Yep, Happy the horse. No. Okay, so be highlighting two important things, please. But 
if you are highlighted, like let's say you do highlight the whole thing and someone asks you what's important and you're like, well, I highlighted the whole thing. But then they're like, but then I have to read the whole thing anyway. So why, so you got to highlight the like the main ideas, right? All right, about one more minute to highlight those things and then I'll see what you guys highlighted and we'll continue on. Are we doing the text questions today? No, text questions are tomorrow. I'm trying to do some Okay. Cool. In real life? I don't see a lot of service dogs out and about. Yes, I have. So we were in Phoenix, okay. And I think the service dogs are Next person. Oh my gosh. I don't understand some people sometimes, but you know, okay. A lot of time, probably. Okay. Let's go ahead and highlight a couple things in our article. So, either online or in person, who has something I can highlight? I do. All right, Don, what do you got? Tweedledum. And 14. So these are some types of therapy animals. Okay. And paragraph 19. What did you get in paragraph 19? Okay. So the co therapist, which means that the person was giving the therapy, but the pony named Happy was also helping out with the therapy, right? The co therapist. Paragraph 7. Paragraph seven says lots of things. What did you highlight in this one? The whole thing. So the use of pets in medical settings actually dates back to more than 150 years. I'm just going to go ahead and highlight that part. So it's not, it's not new that these animals are being used as therapy animals. Anything else get highlighted? I'm not saving. There we go. Any other importance? Hmm? 13. Any sort of animal can be a therapy animal, not just cats or dogs. Good. All kinds of things to highlight, right? How these animals help out. Awesome. Okay. Let's go ahead and go back to our chart and finish it up. I'm just going to copy and paste. I kind of wonder if that person made this like that just so it could get, like, Maybe. All righty. We are now on the bottom boxes here. First thing we need to do is anything that we can connect to. So, Dallin, I don't know if you guys online can hear it, but Dallin has been talking about a service dog that he saw at Chili's one night that was white, but it had been dyed all kinds of different colors by its owner. So that's a connection for him, um, seeing a service dog out and about. Any other ideas of how we can connect to this passage at all? Sorry, say it again. Animals are adorable. This is true. 
animals help with children a lot and animals, sickness and stuff. And animals help with children who are sick. Good. They can, yeah. Yep. Any other ideas? How else can we connect to this story? If you have your own personal connections that you don't want to say out loud, that's fine. You can just type them into yours. I think that's the only thing I've ever seen for this film. And that's a little bit like, I mean, I think people with a leash or not can do the okay with dogs. It's possible. I know, like, how, my uh, dad's fiance had a dog who just gave a dog. Yeah. That could work. Yeah. So you can, some people can probably connect to a family member. Um, my my sister, she had a dog that um, she helped raise to become a service dog for a little boy with autism. So that was really cool. So this dog, he's a big golden retriever. He's adorable. Um, yeah, uh, he now lives on a farm with his family and has helped this little boy with autism be able to like be more comfortable around humans and like talk more. Yeah, so we can connect it to family members. So all kinds of connections with this, right? And most of us probably have a pet or will eventually in our life as well. Whether or not it's a service animal or not, you might have a pet or a bearded dragon. That's gross. Yeah. Yeah. They do that a lot. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, last thing that we need to do that I'm going to have you guys do on your own is write your two to three sentence summary, please. So please write a two to three sentence summary summary okay that is your goal once you finish that up you will be able to if you're online you'll be able to head out after that can you give that to the